department to present to us what his whole graduate career is based off of. Today he's going to be presenting um, Panthers, Palestinians, and the pig power structure, um, which revolves around black intersectionality and the Palestinian revolution. Um, we're going to be giving Derek a free shirt today. I, I will, I will. No, no. I gotta, you gotta hold it, turn okay. around. Perfect. So by the way, <laughs> by the way, yeah, you should all buy a shirt, right? You should get a shirt to help support SJP. I've been dying for long sleeves, so that's good. Okay, that's Excellent. good. I like long sleeves. That's wonderful. Thank you guys so much. Well, wow. 
the statement of the PFLP draws an explicit connection between the fate of black Americans and Palestinians, explaining that, quote, just as we demand the end of siege on our Palestinian people in Gaza and everywhere, so too does the PFLP demand an end to the siege of institutionalized racism in the United States. Ferguson, in the lexicon of the PFLP, was, quote, another emerging intifada in a long line of intifada and struggle by black Americans. Most importantly, the statement concludes, and this is how it concludes, it's written up here so you all can see, that the front encourages all Palestinians, and especially our Palestinian community in the United States, to continue and intensify their efforts in support of the black liberation movement, from joining actions in support of Ferguson and in honor of Michael Brown, to long-term and sustained joint struggle and mutual solidarity with the black movement. There are long histories of this work, and it is critical for all of our communities to expand and deepen our links of struggle and solidarity. That was from August 2014. So, with that said, the purpose of this talk is to turn to these long histories, right, and examine the historical record Indeed, black and Palestinian transnational solidarity has a long and rich tradition and deserves to be explored in depth. Uh, I can in no way cover all of what uh, is considered the, the kind of uh, radical black tradition or the Palestinian revolution and, its con and, and the connections between those two today. I had to tailor the talk to, to cover just a little bit because there's so much. And it's way beyond the scope of an hour long or a 45 minute long talk or however long this will be. I don't know. Uh, but it's, the way we're going to do this today is we're going to be dealing specifically with the 1960s and 1970s, and I'm going to be utilizing three case studies primarily. One is Robert F. Williams. Raise your hand if you know Robert F. Williams in this room. Okay, a small handful. If you don't know Robert F. Williams, you'll get introduced to him today. He's a very, very important figure. Uh, two will be the League of Revolutionary Black Workers in Detroit. Um, I'm from Toledo, Ohio, so if you know Toledo, anyone know Toledo in here? Okay, one, one maybe, so I'm going to sleep a little bit. That's good. We're 45 minutes south of Detroit, right? So it, Detroit's very close in my heart. Um, and the League is very, very important because they develop a very serious analysis of Palestine. And in fact, some of their most controversial work is not just going on strike in the, uh, in the Dodge plants or in the Ford factories, but actually is that when they publish pro-Palestinian editorials in the, new, in the newspaper that they take over, it's, it's a very controversial thing. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that as well. And the third case study will be the Black Panther Party. Raise your hand if you know the Black Panther Party. Okay, good, I should see a lot of hands there, that's good. Um, but the, 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 the analysis of the Panthers here is going to take a slightly different, uh, different turn, so hopefully it'll be a, a little more nuanced than perhaps we've understood in the past. So, uh, that said, we're gonna deal with Robert F. Williams first. So this is Robert F. Williams up here. Uh, that's uh, back in, he's from North Carolina originally, uh, and that's Robert F. Williams with Mao Zedong in China, right, the leader of revolutionary China, uh, where he is going to live a, a portion of his life in exile. We'll talk about that and why it's very, very important <coughs> his analysis of Palestine. Uh, you can see he's, uh, Robert F. Williams is having Mao sign his little red book. Uh, so if you are familiar with the little red book, you know that's a, a series of very important uh, theoretical contributions that Mao has made to uh, revolutionary struggle in not just uh, China, but really world history. Um, so what do you need to know about Robert F. Williams? Well, first, he was the uh, leader of, one of the leaders of the uh, North Carolina NAACP all throughout the 1950s, except he was far more radical than most of the NAACP branches that existed uh, at the time, and he took a, a significantly more radical approach. Uh, Williams' basic philosophy was that racists are, quote, most vicious and violent when they can practice violence with impunity. So Williams' basic project, his goal, was to strip whites of that impunity, and the way that you strip whites of the impunity is that you make sure that you're armed, and you make sure that you can engage in self-defense, right? And so he wrote a very famous book in 1962, he was already in exile by this time, but we'll talk about that, uh, in 1962 called Negroes with Guns, it's a very, very important text that Huey P. Newton, the founder of the Black Panther Party, is going to cite as a major inspiration in his founding of the, of the Panthers in 1966 with Bobby Steele in Oakland. Uh, the, what happens briefly with Robert F. Williams is as a, very uh, militant figure in North Carolina uh, during the era of the Freedom Rides. Uh, everyone's familiar with the Freedom Rides? 
Kind of? Okay. Uh, during the era of the Freedom Rides, there's a very tense situation in Monroe County where uh, Williams is forced to hide to a, a white couple in his home because there's a crowd, a very angry crowd, who's uh, perhaps would not have let them pass safely that evening. And so he keeps them until the next morning. The authorities accuse him of kidnapping them because they want to basically find some trumped up charges to pin him on, pin on him. And he, the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, issues an arrest warrant, right? Uh, accuses him of being schizophrenic and all kinds of really nasty things. And then he is forced to flee. So where does he flee? Like most, many, not m most black revolutionaries uh, who are attempting to uh, flee the United States because of political activism, he ends up in Cuba, right? Just like Asada Shakur, just like Eldridge Cleaver first ends up in Cuba. Cuba at this time is a very new revolutionary state, right? It has joined a kind of internationalist bloc, a uh, socialist bloc, and that is able to provide a space for militants and exiles, right, who are fleeing the kind of, uh, fleeing from really the belly of the beast, right, in, in the center of US empire. So Robert F. Williams from Cuba, is going to start broadcasting a radio program called Radio Free Dixie, where he broadcasts from Cuba revolutionary messages into the American South. He attempts to convince black Southerners or black Americans in general uh, to not go fight in Vietnam and instead fight the US government at home, right? So this is actually his basic message that he's broadcasting from Cuba. The Cubans allow him to do this for a while. Uh, eventually, by 1965, Robert F. Williams is going to leave Cuba and he's going to end up in China, right? China is also a very revolutionary place at this time. Uh, and so Robert F. Williams will end up by 1965 in China. And while in China, and this is, this is the very important part for our story, is that China also, East Asia in general, North Korea, Vietnam, and China, all of these places in East Asia are going to provide very important spaces, right, where political activists from all around the world who are facing persecution somewhere else, like in the United States, where these guys can end up, these men and women can end up uh, meeting with all kinds of other revolutionary exiles, right? Or other kind of revolutionary uh, uh, movements and guerrilla fighters and all kinds of different people with different national liberation movements in mind. And so what happens in China, and this is a very, very important document that was pulled uh, from the University of Michigan uh, they have a big archive on, on Robert F. Williams, is that in, while he's in China, in April 1968, he meets the Fatah delegation, right, of, of two uh, guerrilla fighters. And they convince him of the necessity of developing a serious analysis of Palestine. And so I, it's, a, it's a little light, uh, it's a little small, but I'll read it to you. Um, it says, I recently had an opportunity to confer with and to exchange information with two young members of the Palestinian National Liberation Movement, Fatah, this highly fruitful meeting gave me a broader understanding of the issues involved in the Arab pe people's patriotic struggle against Israeli aggression and expansionist Zionism. After being, sorry, I can't, this is very small. Um, after being apprised of the expansionistic policies of Israel, I am convinced that Israel is embarked on a sinister mission of genocide against the Arab people. It is more than obvious that the objective of the world Zionist movement is the eventual conquest of all Arab lands and the extermination of the Arab people. With the support of US and British imperialism, world Zionism is endeavoring to emulate the Europeans' plunder and conquest of the Indians' land now called America. The Arab people today are threatened by Zionism with the, hope, with the, whole, uh, with the same fate of the American Indians, only through unshakable unity, boundless sacrifice, and a furious will to violently resist the evil designs of Zionism can such an evil conspiracy be frustrated? This is very, very important, right? And then he goes on to talk about uh, the uh, important similarities between the struggles of the Arab people and the African American people, etc. But he develops, so this is, this is a very important concept to think about. This is a black revolutionary from the American South who after spending some time in Cuba ends up in China, and then in China meets Palestinians where he develops an analysis of Zionism and Palestine and Israel in China, in revolutionary China, right? So you have to understand how these transnational circuits of knowledge production and transfer are operating at this time, right? You have socialist states, you have revolutionary states, 
right, that are able to then provide space where people can develop these kinds of ideas, and not only develop them in an abstract sense, but develop them through actual genuine human connection, right? So this is a very, very important document, and you'll notice it also comes on April uh, 5th, 13th, 1968. This is one month after the very important Battle of Karama in March of 1968 where Palestinian and Jordanian fighters, far outnumbered by the Israelis, are going to very steadfastly hold off uh, a, a very brutal and vicious Israeli military assault. And it's going to be a very inspirational battle that uh, Palestinians are going to celebrate for, for really the rest of history, right? Because it's one of the first times when all after 67, when the big Arab governments have failed, this small group of guerrilla fighters and uh, some Jordanian soldiers were able to fend off the Israeli action inflict some serious damages and casualties on this giant military machine, right? And so this is, he's developing this analysis one month after that event, right, in China. So it's very, very important to understand Williams. Uh, not only that, he also signed a very important document in the history of black Palestinian solidarity, uh, which if you guys are unfamiliar with uh, learnpalestine.politics.oxford, right, you should know this website. It's uh, the website for the Palestinian Revolution by Dr. Takriti here at UH. Uh, him and his partner, Carmen Nabusi. Uh, this appeal, which is unfortunately also very blurry, but if you can see down here, it's an appeal uh, by black Americans against the United States support of the Zionist government of Israel. Here, this is in the midst of Black September, when the Jordanian military is crushing the Palestinian uh, guerrilla fighters in Jordan trying to push them out of Jordan, right? This is a very long history. We're not going to get into it today, uh, right now. But this is a very important document that comes in 1970, and Robert F. Williams is signed right here at the bottom. Now, by 1970, Robert F. Williams is no longer in China. He eventually, in 1969, makes his way back into the United States, and he ends up in Detroit, Michigan. Right? So he's no longer in North Carolina. He's still not welcome in North Carolina. Uh, but he ends up in Detroit, Michigan. And that's very important because uh, when we, the next group we're going to talk about, right, is, uh, is the League of Revolutionary Black Workers in Detroit. And it might seem like it's just happenstance, it's just circumstance that Robert F. William ends up in Detroit, all right? But it's actually a very important connection, a very important linkage. Because the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, which originally begins as one union in the Dodge plant up in Detroit, the Dodge Revolutionary Union Movement, the acronym is DRUM, uh, they actually begin even earlier at Wayne State University, right? It's a group of Wayne State University students who form uh, this group called Yuhuru, which is Swahili for liberation or freedom, right? Depending on how you translate it. And they are this sort of militant black nationalist organization that is also engaged in, in, in pol politics of black internationalism, right? And they, in 1963, they form in 1964, these young Wayne State students, including guys like John Watson and Charles Johnson. Uh, Charles, his nickname is Mao, by the way, Charles Mao Johnson, because he's a, a, a very big proponent of Mao uh, and, and, and Maoist literature. Uh, and then Luke Tripp, who was also a very, very important figure in, in this organization, uh, they take, they form a delegation and they head to Cuba in 1964, right? So you have this black student group in the US heading over to Cuba, forming a delegation, a solidarity delegation to Cuba. And in Cuba, who's in Cuba in 1964? Robert F. Williams, right? So they meet this other guy, Robert F. Williams, that we just talked about in Cuba, right? This political exile. They meet Fidel Castro, uh, and they also begin to, to, to develop a political analysis analysis with one another, right? They begin to engage in, in, in these kinds of uh, broad transnational uh, connections. So you're in Cuba dealing with other revolutionaries, black revolutionaries from other parts of the United States, and then eventually Robert F. Williams, after his detour in China, is going to end back up in Detroit, where these guys are coming from. So you see how these, these circuits are very important, right? Revolutionary politics is not just about ideas, it's also about people and connections and networks, right? And forming close networks and making bonds with human beings. This is a very, very important part of struggle, right? And so, uh, what do we need to know about the League? Uh, well, we need to know a few things about the League. Uh, one is that they had a very innovative technique, which was they 
thought that they were going to, some of the students, in fact, uh, I don't know if I have a picture of John Watson up here. The, the guy on the right is Kenneth Cockrell. He's a brilliant, brilliant orator. You should all know Kenneth Cockrell in Detroit. If you get a chance, type him into YouTube after this uh, and just listen to some of the things he said. I mean, the guy was brilliant and very, very underappreciated in, in, on the US left. Uh, Kenneth Cockrell is very brilliant, but we, also John Watson was a guy who was at Wayne State University in 1967, 68, and there was a newspaper at Wayne State University called the South End, right? The South End was like the equivalent of the Daily Cougar, right? Uh, and what John Watson, his idea, he's part of this League of Revolution at this point called Drum, right? The idea is, is that the paper doesn't belong to the campus, the paper doesn't belong to the teachers or the professors or the administration. It doesn't even belong to the students as students. The paper, the South End, is meant to be owned by the community. It's meant to serve the community, right? And so what they do is they take the South End, and John Watson, as editor of the South End, turns the newspaper into an organ of revolutionary struggle, his thesis being that it belongs to the people. So this is how they outline what the South End is supposed to do under Watson's leadership. They say that the South End returns to Wayne State with the intention of promoting the interest of the impoverished, oppressed, and exploited, and powerless victims of white, racist, monopoly, monopoly capitalism, and imperialism. So if you can imagine the Daily Cougar putting as their mission statement that kind of statement, right? Maybe we wouldn't have it. Or maybe we just need some really good editors. I don't know, the Daily Cougar. But, uh, but this would be um, a promising to always take the hard line. The inscription on the paper's masthead uh, in 1968, it eventually switches to this. This is a later one. But in 1968, the masthead read, the year of the heroic gorilla. Okay? So you can already see by 1968 what they're alluding to with this, right? You have uh, the successful revolution in Cuba, right? The successful revolution in China. You have Palestinian guerrillas operating all throughout this time. And so 1968 becomes the year of the heroic guerrilla. And uh, later on, the, the line becomes, one class conscious worker is worth 100 students. All right? So this is a different, a different <laughs> debate. Uh, but we, will discuss, we won't discuss that one today, but that's, a, that's an important theoretical innovation as well. Um, so the League is very important in their own right. I mean, uh, if, you, if you want a really good book about the League, Detroit, I Do Mind Dying is a very important text. Um, I would highly encourage everyone to, to get it and to read it uh, because they do a lot of very important things in the factories. They do a lot of very important, they have a very important analysis of capitalism and racism and how these things intersect. Uh, and how they function with one another. And they have a very important and nuanced understanding of which uh, of, of black Americans place in, in, in their role as a vanguard, a revolutionary vanguard uh, against, against US capitalism and racism. But uh, their most in, one of their most controversial decisions comes in early uh, 1969 when they publish an editorial that is uh, actually, it's just a, it's a copy and paste editorial from Fatah, one of the revolutionary organizations in Palestine. They copy this in, in, in a show of support for the Palestinians, and immediately, none of their other revolutionary rhetoric, not Vietnam, nothing else uh, irked the administration as much as this, as this publication on Palestine, right? Uh, and so immediately, the president of Wayne State University condemns the South End as anti-Semitic and reminiscent of Hitler's Germany. Uh, despite rebuttals and letters to the editor defending Israel, city, state, and union officials joined in on the attack. Local papers like the Detroit News and the Detroit Free Press, as well as television stations, com uh, compounded the assault. On February 3, the paper's office was a victim of an arson attempt. Uh, ju uh, this is uh, Nick Medvecki, who was one of the white radicals who worked alongside uh, the league says, John Watson and myself came out with a front page news editorial statement on El Fata. Little did we know at the time what a Pandora's box had been opened, right? So this was the big kind of, I mean, this drew a lot of ire of the administration. This was a very, very uh, tumultuous period for them. Uh, and they had to field all kinds of criticisms, right? Criticism of anti-Semitism, all kinds of different accusations. Uh, but they really put themselves out on a limb here. And it's very important as well because the South End wasn't meant to just be a student paper, it was also meant to be an organizing tool. Meaning that they took the South End, which had about a, a circulation of about 18,000, right? Or about, they printed about 18,000 weekly. Uh, and they would take them to the factories. And they would utilize the student newspaper 
as an organ of revolutionary uh, agitation in the factories. So this is a very, very important uh, uh, development, right, for them. Uh, the South End becomes a very important tool. As you can see, a lot of their pamphlets are translated into Arabic. Uh, why? Because they're operating in Detroit. And what do we have in Detroit? Yeah, we have Dearborn, right, which is a huge, huge Arab community. Um, and in fact, in Detroit, we don't have to deal too much with the numbers, but of the 15,000 Arab members in the National United Auto Workers, the UAW, uh, the vast majority of them were in the Detroit area, right, working in, in plants in Detroit, right, and, you know, around Dearborn where a lot of, a lot of uh, Arabs live. Now, the problem comes in the fact that when the League put themselves on the line, right, and this is where the theme of reciprocity in Dr. Gerald Horn's talk comes in, is that when they put themselves on the line and really went out of the way to develop this analysis on Palestine, when they engaged in the strikes, right, a lot of wildcat strikes, a lot of different things, unfortunately, a lot of the Arab workers tended to cross the picket line, right? Uh, they didn't engage in, in that sort of reciprocal solidarity, right? So that's a very important, uh, and, and there's reasons we can perhaps discuss later for that. Uh, but uh, this is one of the pitfalls and limitations, right? And this is one of the, the themes that Dr. Horn talks about when he's talking about reciprocity, is we have to be cognizant of some of the, the, the failures of that, right, of, that, of this tradition, um, and, and how to avoid them in the future. That's always key, right? Well, what, what kind of things can you do differently? Uh, so this is, this is the League, right? These are two very important, uh, Robert F. Williams and the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, two very important, uh, pivotal moments in, uh, Black Palestinian solidarity. Now we're going to deal with the Black Panther Party. The Black Panther Party, of course, is the most visual representation of the Black Liberation Movement in the U.S. all throughout the 1960s and 1970s. It is by far the most uh, powerful organization in terms of media presence, in terms of mobilizational capacity, in terms of being a broad network of revolutionaries all throughout the U.S. and really throughout the world because the Panthers, of course, end up, they have an international section based in Algiers under Cleaver's tutelage, uh, and there's all kinds of things that are going on with the Panthers that we're going to talk about. Um, for our talk, for our purposes, the Black Panther Party represents a longer tradition of black power diplomacy in the third world. That's a phrase from historian Sean Malloy. He wrote a very important book last year called Out of Oakland, which I would highly encourage everyone to pick up if you get the chance. Uh, this is where also a lot of these pictures are coming from. These pictures are from the Black Panther Party newspaper, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, just to briefly give you the contours of the Black uh, Panther Party's uh, history and trajectory. The early years from 1966 to 1967 were dominated by a policy of what they called patrolling the pigs. And we will talk all about this the etymological lineage of the word pig in the Panthers lexicon because it's very, very important to their understanding of the world, right? And we'll talk all about this. Uh, but what did patrolling the pigs mean? It meant that um, you followed the police around with shotguns and made sure that they weren't doing things like abusing people and killing people and murdering them in black communities. And this was a very, very innovative technique. And it was also a very uh, important legal technique because up until 1967, the, you were allowed to open carry shotguns in, in the state of California. And this is where, of course, the Black Panther Party starts in 1966 uh, with Huey Newton and Bobby Seale in Oakland, California. And this, causes a lot of tension in the state. Uh, the California state letter legislature does not like this. The police, of course, do not like this. Uh, but they really have a lot of trouble pinning anything legally on the Panthers. So very quickly, Ronald Reagan and uh, a, a guy named Mulford, they passed this thing in 67 called the Mulford Act, which is the first piece of serious, uh, serious gun legislation, uh, gun control legislation in California in 1967. Uh, and this is meant to basically do away with open carry. The Panthers end up going to the Sacramento uh, courthouse and having a massive display where they, where they take their guns. It's a very big deal. They run, you know, uh, Ronald Reagan off the lawn at the time. It's a big, you know, this is a big, whole big thing. Uh, so it's very important to understand because sometimes out here you have the gun control groups or, or the, the NRA type groups and they have pictures of Ronald Reagan and stuff. Uh, so, but that, you know, you have to understand that this piece of legislation comes under Reagan, right? Uh, so gun control comes from, from Reagan in California because at this juncture it's, it's black people with guns, right? And this is, uh, you have to understand gun control is not a, a, a color neutral thing, right? I mean, this is very important 
piece of US history. Uh, but more importantly, the Panthers developed this idea, they don't, and they, they really borrow this idea from Harold Cruz, who is also, uh, has a longer tradition in the, in the Communist Party of the Black Belt thesis, but they developed the idea that black Americans in the US uh, form a kind of internal colony, right? They form, and, and there's different, at different times, it takes different shapes. Sometimes it's uh, a sort of geographic area, as in the Black Belt Thesis of 1928. Or sometimes it's, in this era, a, a dispersed colony, right? But the relationship to the structures of power is a colonial one. And this is a very important uh, theoretical analysis, a theoretical contribution that the Panthers make. Newton, in the second issue of the Black Panther Party newspaper, says, there is a great similarity between the occupying army in Southeast Asia and the occupation of our communities by the racist police. Uh, and in order to then develop this model, uh, they, you have to deal with this notion of the term pig, right? Which, the Panther, which becomes a core aspect of the Panther's vernacular. Uh, so the etymological lineage of this word in the Panther lexicon is very important to understand. Uh, the use of the symbol and the, and the word pig, right, to reference the police, begins really in May 1967. It becomes, the, the Panthers take this up, as explicitly take this up as part of their newspaper uh, and as part of their writings in May of 1967. Huey Newton and Eldridge Cleaver, who we're going to talk about more later, they're sitting around in the office and they're kicking around this idea of what do we call these guys, right, uh, and they're throwing around words like, you know, we already call them fascists, we already call them swine. But it's not picking up with the masses. The masses aren't grabbing onto this word. So what can we use? Newton throws pig out there. Cleaver sits down with a typewriter and starts typing a definition of the word pig. And this is what he comes up with. He comes up with a low-natured beast that has no regard for law, justice, or the rights of people. A creature that bites the hand that feeds it. A foul, foul depraved producer, usually found masquerading as the victim of an unprovoked attack. So, the Panthers develop this idea that the, the, the police are the pigs, right? The police are the pigs. But beyond that, they then extrapolate and project this term onto a much broader institution of power, right? So this, at first, begins with the, the symbol of the pig. It's very important. Anyone know who, who does these? Uh, does anyone? It says it right here. Emery Douglas, right? The artist. Who does this? Emory Douglas, you should know him. Uh, he, his art becomes very iconic in this era uh, because, of, because of his work in the Black Panther Party newspaper. When he was a young, uh, he was a, in juvie, uh, one of his jobs was taking care of pigs, right? He, had, he was actually in jail, I mean, as a youth offender, uh, and he was taking care of pigs, so he had a very intimate connection with pigs. Uh, and it, you know, he didn't like it, he didn't like it very much. Uh, and so he actually then. This is a very personal thing for him because he develops this term based on this personal experience, right? And so he's, he draws a lot of pics throughout his, his artistic career. Uh, and so this is, this is all some of, uh, some of the, just a few examples of the kind of symbolism that's going to be very prolific throughout the Panthers paper. Uh, so what happens with this, though, is that it be eventually becomes uh, projected onto a much broader series of, uh, or a much broader institutional form of power, right? If the pig is no longer becomes just a symbol for the police, it also becomes uh, a kind of, the, the pig power structure becomes a term that the Panthers develop as well, right? And this becomes a, a shorthand, really, for US capitalism, for white supremacy, and for American hegemony in the world, right? So this, these kind of three things together, American imperial hegemony, right? US capitalism and white supremacy are all captured by this very short, short term called the international pig power structure. And so this becomes the primary enemy in the Panther literature in 1967, 1968, 1969, and up through 1970, when Newton gets out of jail. And we'll talk about why it shifts after 1970. But for the first maybe three or four years, this becomes really the sort of mobilizing slogan. And why is this? Well, one of the reasons you develop, uh, you develop this is because you're talking, uh, there's, there's a long history of what the Panthers believed in terms of who was going to be the vanguard of the revolution, et cetera. But in general, uh, I think Asada Shakur uh, explains it best. And this is a quote from Asada Shakur. She said, the Panthers didn't try to sound all intellectual, 
talking about the national bourgeoisie, the military industrial complex, the reactionary ruling class, they simply called a pig a pig, right? This is a quote from Masada Shakur. It's a very simple word, right? And anyone can understand it, they can grab onto it, and they can run with it, right? And if you're attempting to actually organize the masses and organize people, plenty of people who aren't really actively actively reading uh, leftist theoretical texts, right? Well, then you need some simple slogans and terms that are going to activate them, that are going to organize them. And this becomes very, very important, right? A very important part of the story. So this international pig power structure is articulated perhaps best by Eldridge Cleaver when he says, internationally, we have to place ourselves in the third world with the oppressed people of the world against the pigs, the international pig power structure. So this served to emphasize the commonalities between oppressed groups around the world, and in many ways was a, a kind of revised version of the early communist internationalism. Opposition to the international pig power structure, uh, according to historian Sean Beloy, was the determining factor in the party's coalition building. So that's very important, right? They're gonna utilize this when they're engaged in all kinds of revolutionary coalition building. Uh, Cleaver also states, in the aftermath of Watts, and all the other uprisings that have set the ghettos of America ablaze, it is obvious that there is very little difference in the way oppressed, feel and oppressed people feel and react. Whether they are oppressed in Algeria by the French, in Kenya by the British, in Angola by the Portuguese, or in Los Angeles by Yankee Doodle. Right? So this is Cleaver. And if you've never listened to Cleaver, you should just spend your evening listening to him on YouTube because he's a very, very powerful speaker, right? He's a brilliant orator. In fact, very different than Huey Newton. When you listen to Huey, he's uh, long and he has this high-pitched voice, and it's uh, he can be very theoretical, right? So it's a very different kind of uh, a different kind of oratory. But um, so theoretically, every strike against U.S. imperialism was a victory for the oppressed everywhere else, and ought to be supported by forces who shared a similar enemy. Enough concomitant strikes and losses for the empire could accumulate and eventually mean the victory of revolutionary forces worldwide. Uh, so where did they articulate this analysis? Well, it's, it's mostly, it, it's in speeches and all kinds of things, right? Uh, but really they utilize the paper, right? The Black Panther Party newspaper. Uh, the Black Panther Community News Service, it eventually becomes the intercommunal news service, which we'll talk about that shift later. But this boasted a weekly circulation of anywhere from 140,000 to 200,000 copies, right? This is big. Uh, this is a very, very big circulation in the US for a revolutionary paper, right? This is, this is uh, we're not talking about a small scale operation here. Uh, by the end of the 1960s, those were the numbers. Uh, and this is one of the main vehicles for how you disseminate these arguments. And if you, it's very important to understand when you look at the early editions of the Black Panther Party newspapers, stuff from 67, 68, 69, uh, the local news and the national news and the sort of world international news, these are all side by side. They're all stuck together, right? So you might have an article on Mexico or an article on Cuba or an article on Brazil or Vietnam or Palestine, and it's right next to something happening in Atlanta or DC or wherever else, right? And so there's no stark juxtaposition between this is what's happening, happening locally, this is what's happening globally, right? It, it becomes a very, uh, it's this, everything is seen as, in fact, all of these things are usually under the subheading of what's, what they title in the paper, the world of black people, indicating that color served as a fixed, not as a fixed cultural or biological construct, but rather as a marker of struggle against white supremacy and imperialism. Now this is going to change in 1971, really, uh, in 1972 when Newton is going to make a very clear juxtaposition between what's local news, what's national news, what's international news, and he really relegates the international stuff uh, to kind of the back pages of the paper. And this is a big, a big shift in the editorial uh, sort of conception of the paper, which we'll talk about, we'll talk about why that happens. But they articulate this thesis, right? This international pig power structure. So how does Palestine factor into that? Well, uh, here you have a very important article that uh, got them a lot of, a, a lot of uh, flack as well when they ran with the title, Palestine Gorillas versus Israeli pigs. As you can see, the Israelis are part of this international pig power structure and the Palestinians are gorillas, engaged in legitimate armed guerrilla struggle just like the Black Panther Party envisioned themselves as engaged in armed liberation struggle in the US. 
Uh, the Black Panther read the Israeli government is an imperialist expansionist power in Palestine. The government is at fault, not all Jews. There are many non-Jews who support what Israel is doing. Pig Johnson, meaning Lyndon Johnson, Pig Johnson is one of them, right? Cleaver, uh, in, the, in the picture I showed you, shoulder to shoulder with Arafat, uh, he says at that, at that moment when that picture is taken, right, at that, at that delegation, the Black Panther Party unequivocally supports the Palestinian people and their vanguard forces in their struggle against the Zionist aggressor and the Hussein reactionaries who have combined with the US imperialist aggressors to drown in blood the glorious march of the Palestinian people to freedom, liberty, independence, and peace. The other member of that picture on the, on the far left, Donald Cock, not up there, but it was an earlier picture for those of you who came in later. Uh, the international member Donald Cox in Kuwait in February of 1971, which is a very important turning date, by the way, in the history of the Black Panther Party, February of 1971, and we'll talk about that. Uh, he's invited uh, to Kuwait to, to, to deal with the Palestinians operating there, and he reaffirms the Black Panther Party's support for the Palestinians. He says, and this is a very, very powerful quote by Donald Cox, if you don't know him, you should look him up as well. He says, the young Fedayeen being trained in the camps, on the battlefields, held captive, these are our revolutionary brothers. The young brothers in the ghettos of the US are our fedayeen, meaning that these are the fighters for our liberation struggle, right? Uh, the young brothers in the ghettos. So that's Donald Cox in Kuwait, talking about uh, organizing black Americans in the, in, and for revolutionary purposes all the way in Kuwait, right? You have to, these transnational circuits are very, very important to understand, very important. Uh, Eldridge Cleaver, as the Minister of Information, uh, really is the guy who pushes this, this kind of program forward, this kind of radical internationalist program. Uh, he begins to build transnational connections with revolutionary state actors and also non-state activists, uh, partially because in 1968 he's ran out of the country. Uh, he gets into a, it's, it's a long story, but he gets into a kind of uh, bad uh, incident with some police. It doesn't go very well, and he's forced to leave the country, uh, and he ends up in Cuba, just as Robert F. Williams ended up in Cuba for a period of time. Now, while in Cuba, Cleaver has this idea that he's going to organize black revolutionaries, and the Cuban government should provide support for them so that they can then, from Cuba, relaunch a kind of guerrilla warfare into the United States from Cuban territory. The Cubans aren't so fond of this idea. They think it's going to cause them, I mean, the Cubans, I mean, to be fair to the Cuban government, they have faced a lot of pressure by the U.S. at this point, uh, and they're, they're dealing with a lot of things at this time. Uh, and so for them, it seems like this isn't the best strategy, right? They're not, they're not necessarily willing to launch an invasion of the United States by black revolutionaries who are trained and, and sort of funded by the Cuban government. Uh, and so Cleaver is kind of looked at as He's welcome to be there in political exile, but he's not, they don't want him training a revolutionary force that will then reinvade the, the US, right? So they kind of push, they sort of gently nudge him out, and they send him to Algiers, right? He ends up in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in Algeria, revolutionary Algeria, where he also begins to develop what he calls his Asian strategy. Uh, and in this Asian strategy, this involves the Panthers developing sort of a revolutionary hope of the East, uh, and just so you guys know, if you don't know who Cleaver and Newton, you should know Huey Newton and Elders Cleaver to see how some pictures. Sometimes having pictures to names helps, right? Uh, he begins to develop what he calls the revolutionary hope of the East. He establishes concrete alliances with North Korea, with North Vietnam, and to a lesser extent with China. But he also continues all kinds of internationalist coalition building more generally, including with Palestinian revolutionaries based in Algiers. So he has all kinds of PLO connections in Algiers. Very important. Uh, his long-term idea is that eventually this will culminate in the formation of a North American Liberation Front, uh, which would eventually, through urban guerrilla warfare, be able to rally enough support to topple the U.S. government. Right, and this is his basic thesis: is that you can eventually, with with once you develop enough support, revolutionary coalition building, right, support from uh, revolutionary states around the world, you'll eventually be able to engage in some kind of revolutionary armed guerrilla struggle in the US. Uh, this was the thesis of RAM, the Revolutionary Action Movement, also in the, in the 1960s. Uh, and this was, th so there are perhaps some problems with this thesis, whether or not it would have actually worked. Uh, but 
He provided a clear model at least. He said, this is what we're going to do, this is what our aim is, this is what these are our goals, and this is what we want to do. And we do that by forming revolutionary alliances around the world. Now, uh, as late as 1970, uh, Huey Newton is also even holding on to this kind of idea in a very in a very sort of abstract capacity. When asked about the influences, Black Panther Party influences, Huey responds, our influences are Fidel and Che. Ho Chi Minh and Mao and Kim Il Sung, but also all the guerrilla bands that have been operating in Mozambique and Angola, and the Palestinian guerrillas who are fighting for a socialist world. Right. So here you have Newton in 1970 explicitly mentioning the Palestinian guerrillas fighting for a socialist world. Right. But Huey Newton in 1970, it's important to understand, is just getting out of a, very, a fairly long term, uh, a fairly long stint in jail. Right. It's a very brutal. Uh, you know, oppressive kind of isolation he faces in jail too. The conditions are very bad. Uh, but he gets out of jail, and for a very brief moment after this, after this, uh, after he gets out, he holds on to this kind of internationalist, radical internationalism. He offers to send an unspecified number of black troops to Vietnam to help the uh, Vietnamese fight the Americans. The Vietnamese politely decline his offer, say thank you, but you don't have to do that. Um, and so he, at this point, for a brief period, is still holding on to this program. However, by 1970, the Panthers have been attacked very, very harshly, right, all throughout the United States. Uh, you had a couple dozen Panther members killed. In 1969, you had the very famous assassination of Fred Hampton, right, in Chicago. Uh, you had Panther offices burned, shot, uh, attacked. You had all kind, of, all kinds of psychological warfare. Quantel Pro was engaged in all kinds of psychological manipulation. J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI are doing all kinds of things to undermine the Panthers to create schisms in the Panthers. And a lot of a lot of revolutionaries, even in the Black Panther Party, uh, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's difficult, right? Some of them are tired. It's, it's a very uh, difficult process. Newton, at the time, begins to argue that. The, this kind of armed guerrilla struggle that Cleaver wants to engage in from Algeria, right, is not perhaps the appropriate methodology for revolution in the US. But he needs a new kind of theoretical framework to do this, to argue this, and so he comes out of jail in 1970, and at Boston College in November of 1970, he develops this brand new idea, right, this term that he coins himself called revolutionary intercommunalism. Now, it's a very different kind of phrase than the international pig power structure or off the pigs or the very simple stuff that came with the early Panthers, right? And in fact, this is one of this is one of Newton's problems with articulating it is that when he develops this new argument, it's a very convoluted theoretical argument, right? And we'll briefly outline it for you, but you don't need to spend a whole lot of time with it. But uh, if you want, you should go home and read it. You know, you should read his his uh, his text, uh, his speech. Uh, intercommunalism is basically the notion that the U.S. empire is so powerful and far-reaching that it's fundamentally changed everything and undermined the very notion of a nation-state. Nations as such no longer existed because there was one hegemonic world system with the U.S. at the helm. Because of this, the traditional colonial analysis, uh, you have to do away with the traditional colonial analysis, right? Black Americans are no longer an internal colony. And instead, black people were not a nation, right, but a community. And as such, it was futile to pursue international alliances premised on the, prim the primacy of the nation state, right? So the nation state is no longer the primary sort of uh, vehicle either of uh, the world system or of liberation struggle, right? So the old model of liberation, the old anti-colonial liberation movement, this is no longer the appropriate model for, for revolution. Uh, Newton declares very confidently that the Black Panther Party, we are no longer internationalists. We're not afraid about that. He says nation states have been replaced with a, quote, global village. The central organizing unit was not the nation, but the community, quote, a small unit with a comprehensive collection of institutions that exist to serve a small group of people. In essence, the Panther Party was no longer committed to a guerrilla war for national liberation, and instead shifted to the survival of service programs, which transformed the previous function of these programs as from an organizing tool almost into an end in themselves. If you know anything about the Panthers, 
You know that they engage in breakfast for children programs, sickle cell anemia testing, uh, all kinds of educational initiatives, right? All kinds of very, very important services that they provided to black communities. The difference was, these had historically, when you, when you hear Fred Hampton talking about them, for instance in Chicago, before he's assassinated, these were tools to, to organize and mobilize the masses, right? Your basic thesis was that people learn basically by observation and participation, and you get people to observe and then participate in the program, and then you draw them into revolutionary struggle. So Newton's new thesis is that with this sort of revolutionary intercommunalism, uh, you engage in these survival programs, right, because the primary goal at this time is to survive until consciousness can be raised to the point that maybe in the future you can have some kind of revolutionary struggle. But that's at some predetermined, far off date, you don't know it. So engaging with Eldridge Cleaver's theory of armed guerrilla struggle, right, is no longer the way to go. So we have to read this in the context of the Panthers having been attacked, right, for a very long time. Uh, but there's very serious resistance within the Black Panther Party to this new approach. Uh, so you're going to have Cleaver's uh, North American Liberation Front. This, this at least offered a clear plan for, for liberation, right? Newton says we need to, get, we need to do away with this. Uh, and urban, this, all this stuff about urban guerrilla warfare against US capitalism or overthrowing the federal government, you, you, this is no longer the, the first and foremost, mo most important goal. The most important goal is raising consciousness through these kind of survival programs. So what you do, in Newton's theory, is that you close down as many of the chapter Panther, uh, the chapters of the Black Panther Party all across the nation, and you pull them back to Oakland. You pull as many of the, the sort of leading cadre of these, of these chapters, you bring them back to Oakland, you form a base of operations in Oakland, and then you can, once you form this strong base of operations, you can engage in survival programs, you can take, you can kind of take over Oakland, right, and have a center, a base, right, where you can then do, we, for, at least theoretically, you could eventually do some, some bigger things, right? But the initial, uh, the initial strategy is pull everyone back to Oakland, close ranks, uh, set up shop there. And what ends up happening is that this more or less becomes a kind of early NGO model, right? Is that you, you do breakfast for children programs, you do educational programs, you do all kinds of things, but it's, it's situated uh, in Oakland and it's no longer tied to kind of armed guerrilla struggle, right? So this sort of fades into the background. Uh, Asada Shakur, if you read her autobiography, she's not very fond of this model. Uh, she all, you should definitely read her autobiography. She, uh, at, at one point, she says almost no one understood Huey's long speeches on intercommunalism. Uh, he had a very high-pitched, monotonous voice, and his rambling for three hours about the negation of the negation was a sheer disaster, right? So Asada Shakur has a very negative assessment of New, uh, Newton's new theory. Kathleen Cleaver, who is Eldridge Cleaver's wife living in Algeria, says it was incoherent particularly if you are part of a socialist world that practices, or at least pays lip service to, international proletarian solidarity, and solidarity is how we're able to live there and stay in Algeria, right? So this, there was a lot of, a lot of animosity toward trying to incorporate this, this new theory. Uh, eventually, these ideological differences are going to be exacerbated. Uh, when you have the assassina assassination of Fred Hampton in 69, in January 1976, um, the expulsion of Geronimo Pratt, who was, uh, Newton is going to expel Geronimo Pratt, who was this uh, Vietnam vet who came back and was attempting, he was actually sent by Newton into the American South to form, to sort of organize a clandestine military wing of the Black Panther Party. Uh, eventually he's arrested in Dallas in 1970. Uh, and Newton, once he's arrested in Dallas in 1970, Newton expels him from the party. Uh, Newton, perhaps at this point, is very paranoid about having a paramilitary structure that he doesn't have full control over. Um, and Newton is going to expel Geronimo Pratt in 1970. And then finally, one of the sort of last bastions of internationalism, George Jackson, is going to be assassinated in uh, August of 1971. And so once this happens, uh, basically any, the, the, the big main uh, adherents of the kind of radical internationalism posited by Cleaver are sort of driven out of the party, right? The more militant wing of the party is driven out, and Newton is, is more or less able to do what he wants. Cleaver himself is stuck in Algeria. Newton, in February of 1971, and this is the very important turning date, 
Newton and Cleaver are supposed to have a, a television phone conversation with on a local television station in 71, uh, where they're going to settle the party differences, there's going to be unity, etc. And Newton uh, more or less uh, gets on. Cleaver immediately starts going after Newton, demanding that there needs to be changes, demanding armed revolutionary struggle, uh, more or less calling Newton out for this new policy. Newton is very angry on the telephone. They get they uh, hang up. Newton then expels at that very moment expels Cleaver from the party, and Cleaver is no longer attached to the Black Panther Party officially. Right? He becomes a kind of pariah within the Black Panther Party movement. Although the, there's significant segments of the Panthers who are still attached to Cleaver, right? And it, it becomes a very acrimonious situation where everyone in the party is forced to take a side. You either have to choose Newton or you have to choose Cleaver. And it's not just a personal beef, right? It's about very different revolutionary strategies. How do you overthrow the system of world imperialism and white supremacy and capitalism? How do you deal with it, right? Uh, so it's a, it's a very stark ideological distinction between these two, between these two guys. Um, after this expulsion, uh, really this is gonna mark the end of the kind of radical internationalism of the Panthers. So the old stuff, that they used to talk about, I don't know if I have another slide after this, maybe I don't. Um, the old stuff that they used to talk about Palestinian guerrillas and overthrowing uh, you know, the Israeli expansionist state. By 1974, the Black Panther Party newspaper is pushing a very different line, right? Under the edit editorial leadership of a guy named David Graham Du Bois and Huey Newton. Newton is coming up with this new idea based on revolutionary intercommunalism. Uh, that instead, they published this really infamous article, it's a very bad article, you should read it, but it's very bad, uh, in terms of its analysis. Newton comes with this uh, title called, The Issue Isn't Territory, But Human Rights, right? So this is his new theoretical line on Palestine, that it's not about territory, it's not about national liberation, it's just about human rights. And so what does he argue in this paper? The position is basically, accepts the, accepts the existence of Israel, and more or less pushes a two-state solution. Uh, and the Panthers, he, he admits, should no longer be seen as only pro-Arab, right? As pro-Arab alone. Instead, uh, Newton explicitly calls for what he, an end to what he calls the, the so-called holy war against Israel. And uh, instead, Arabs should focus on challenging Arab governments in the region, right? So Israel should no longer be the main target. It should be Arab governments in the region who are part and parcel of the imperial system, right? Israel was, quote, a manifestation of national sovereignty for the Jewish people. This is one of the lines, right, that, that Newton pushes. And also, uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran and Jordan are the main bastions of empire in the Middle East, not Israel, right? So this is the new line that Newton is pushing. Now, in some ways, he's not wrong in the sense that Saudi Arabia and Jordan and Iran are bastions of empire in the Middle East. But Israel is also part and, part, uh, part and parcel of that system, right? And it's a very intricate part of that system. It's in fact one of the, the, the primary parts of that system. Uh, Newton's, unfortunately, his analysis is so bad that David Graham Du Bois even has to kind of like check him sometimes when Newton tries to talk about Palestine uh, in the first edition. He says, you know, look, Israel, uh, Palestine was a kind of arid place, an arid desert before the Israelis came. Uh, and they, they made it blossom, right? This is Newton repeating a lot of the Zionist mantra that's very popular at the time, you know, in the, all throughout the Zionist historiography and the Zionist argument for the settlement of Palestine. Uh, David Graham Du Bois actually, in the, in the edition that gets published, has to check Newton and say, hold on, this is a kind of racist line. That's uh, not true. And so Newton agrees to take it out. But it shows you how regressive Newton's thinking had become on the issue of Palestine, right? It was no longer solidarity with Palestinian guerrillas fighting a legitimate struggle. It was now this kind of, he had bought into a lot of, uh, a lot of the kind of tropes. Uh, so this is the end, really. Uh, this, is, this is the big schism that exists in the party. And thus far, a lot of historians have dealt with, even the historians uh, who have dealt with Pal the Black Panther Party's position on Palestine, They've registered the shift. They understand the 1974 shift. Hey, it's a different analysis. But they don't really understand why. They don't frame it in this context of the decline of, of this kind of radical internationalist position that's put forward by Cleaver, right? Uh, and they don't understand it within you know, how revolutionary communalism is kind of dictating these new terms. Uh, at the same time, 
1973 marks, there's a lot, 1972, 1973 marks a lot of different shifts in the geopolitical sphere, right? You have the Mao Nixon meetings, right? Where revolutionary China is no longer so revolutionary. Uh, you have 1973, the, the overthrow of Allende in Chile, new neoliberal economic policies, neoliberal economic policies in Egypt, right? And also is no longer there. You no longer have a bastion of sort of Arab revolution in the Middle East at all, uh, not in, the, in, in a serious capacity. And so this is, these, these are all registering very, very important shifts, right? Um, so only for the sake of time, I, I will close here without uh, asking too many questions. Uh, but there's, there's a lot of questions that this brings up, right? There are questions of leadership, uh, questions of circuits of knowledge production, right? Why is Newton able to push such a bad position in 1974? Well, one of the reasons perhaps is he's not, Cleaver is in Algiers. He's dealing with Palestinians on a daily basis. You know, he's dealing with Algerians and Arabs. Uh, and he's, he's very intricately bound up with that analysis. Now, if you know what happens to Cleaver after 1973, it's hard, it's hard to, to defend the guy, right? Because if you know what Cleaver does afterwards, he's essentially driven out of Algeria. The, uh, he's isolated from the Black Panther Party. Um, he, by 19, 1980s, he becomes a rabid uh, Zionist, a conservative. Uh, he runs on the Republican ticket back in California at one point. Um, he forms all kinds of kind of quasi-religious organizations. He starts up a brand of, uh, wow, well, that's a long story. <laughs> he starts up a brand of pants, which you should look up. Um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, so the, the, the issue is not that Cleaver is right and always right. Right? It's not that he's, he's the sort of figure that you always need to listen to, but for a slice of time, Cleaver was making a very important theoretical argument. Right? He was making a very important theoretical contribution uh, that we need to understand in its moment and in its context, right? as perhaps being significantly more revolutionary than Newton's revolutionary intercommunalism. And you can see the effects that Newton's intercommunalism had when it comes to the analysis of Palestine. Right? So in conclusion, it's very important for us to understand the historical legacy of transnational solidarities in our movements, uh, but that means more than simply repeating celebratory accounts of history, uh, accounts where this person said this nice thing about Palestine, or this person supported the black struggle. We also need to be honest with ourselves about the pitfalls and shortcomings of these processes and the analyses produced, the analyses produced by them. By critically engaging with these histories, we can learn a lot. Uh, from the most advanced positions, we can learn how to think about revolutionary solidarities and how to formulate them today. The mistakes and pitfalls, we can contextualize, and we can understand in their moment uh, while also garnering insight on how to avoid them in the future. In other words, we have to move beyond superficial understandings of solidarity, and we have to think more deeply about a variety of questions, what solidarity means, and what are its possibilities and its limitations. Thank you very much. that 
what it often means is that big projects for, for liberation are more or less uh, impossible, right? And that big projects always lead to collapse, right? Big projects are always doomed to fail because the only mo model, the only method of, of change can be at small kind of micro level, community level, based all this, this kind of building, right? This is where you can have real human relationship, blah, blah, blah. So there is this, this is a, actually a very long tradition. Um, and it's not just Newton, of course, but there's, all, and, and on both the right and the left, actually, there's both the right and the left have articulated this, this vision uh, in different ways. Um, I, I'm not opposed to micro-level community organizing at all. I think it's very important, right? But uh, do I think also that internationalist political alliances of the kind that Cleaver was talking about are important? Yeah, do I think eschewing the nation-state model is, is possible? Uh, I, I don't think so. I think, I think uh, Algeria and Cuba and China and North Korea provided very, very important spaces, revolutionary spaces, where people could or organize and do things and, and, and engage in all kinds of struggles that otherwise perhaps they may not have, uh, where you can't do on, on simply a community level. But you're right, Newton said this. He said, look, who are we selling newspapers to? Are we selling them to the black community or are we selling them to Koreans and Chinese? And this is, this is I mean, Newton actually says this in one of the arguments about his new policy, right? Is that we're not selling the Black Panther Party newspaper to, to the Chinese Communist Party or to North Koreans, right? We're selling it to the people in the black community. You need to take deal with the black community. All this international stuff, it's too much. You know, it's too big of a project. Uh, we can still have sympathies, but that's very different than thinking that we're actually going to over... But what is a couple? We're not going to overthrow the government, right? You're not going to have a, a new revolutionary potential that'll come out of it. So uh, for me, it's a very pessimistic reading. I think it means that you, you're you have to give up that kind of uh, hope of, of large-scale liberation, and I'm not sure if I'm convinced. I'm, I'm not ready to give that up. Mm -hmm. yeah. cool. Personally, thank you. Yes. Um, I was wondering. You mentioned you posed a question like, what pushed you and Newton to um, propose these like almost Zionist ideals? Mm -hmm. But do you what do you think would even explain the shift in his thinking in the first place? Um. So. Well, I think, I think theoretically it comes from this new model, right? I think, you know, this kind of revolutionary intercommunalism, the idea is that Palestinian liberation is about liberating Palestine to have a Palestinian state, right? And, and, and this is no longer the appropriate model for liberation. So the appropriate model for the Palestinians are a community, right? Black people are a community. They're no longer a nation. And so you don't want a, a new nation state model as the form of liberation. So territory isn't the issue. You don't liberate Palestine. You develop human rights, right, in the Palestinian territories, or you develop human rights in Israel, right, for Palestinians, right? This is kind of the new, the new model that's that's being pushed. That said, I also think it's just a deficient, it's just a, a deficiency Newton had. Newton wasn't well read on Palestine, right? He didn't have deep and close connections, especially at this period, regularly with Palestinians, with Arabs, etc. You know what I mean? Not in any, not in the way that Cleaver did. Or in the way that George Jackson did. When George Jackson is in prison, right, his inclination, uh, and I know Patrick knows this well, I think it was you who shared it the other day. Uh, uh, George Jackson was talking about his primary goal, was to, you know, one of the big things he wanted to do was learn Chinese and learn Arabic, because then he could communicate with a significant portion of the world's population, right? I mean, this was the idea, is that you actually had to know these histories well and know the community well and know, uh, know the region. And, and so I think Newton was susceptible to these kind of Zionist ideas, partially because he just didn't know it well, uh, but also because revolutionary intercommunalism led you down that direction. Right. And I think that's I think I, I think that's at least a partial. I also I don't know. You know what I mean? I wish Newton was still around. Unfortunately, if you know what happened to Newton, he was killed in '84, right? Very very early, very young. Uh, yeah, it was a very a very terrible situation, but. Um, so we don't know, you know, it's a difficult thing. But I think those, at least those two things interact. Um, so piggybacking off of uh, Leosa's question on large organizing, when like the Black Panther was starting to move away from like guerrilla warfare and moving towards like service programs and how we wanted to raise con consciousness, was like the end goal to like disregard guerrilla warfare entirely, was that mission gone or was it towards like just education and outreach yeah, well, so that's actually a really good question. Um, it's not entirely clear, right? Because Newton actually doesn't, with this new revolutionary intercommunalism, I mean, what I highly suggest is that you guys would go home and you, you read him. You read Newton, right? I mean, read his speeches on revolutionary intercommunalism. I mean, Asada Shakur wasn't joking when she was complaining about his three-hour-long uh, 
expose is on revolutionary intercommunalism and the negation of the negation and what does this mean? Nobody knew what it meant, right? So uh, people were having a very difficult time conceptualizing it and understanding it. So we don't really know what the end goal was. Uh, I mean, he, I think he thinks he had an end goal. Uh, and perhaps was there a guerrilla struggle, perhaps at some point in vision for it? Maybe. But what does he end up doing? They end up running Bobby Seale uh, and Elaine Brown for office, right, in California. So this becomes the new model. Of not only do you move people into survival programs, you also start engaging in electoral politics. And once you start engaging, I mean, perhaps there's a we can have a debate about what the place is for electoral politics, right? But what this does is it basically drives the party into into the ground. You know what I mean? Uh, it dwindles after this. It's you know all the chapters around the country are closed down, um, or at least you know they're they're operating at a very uh, Less, uh, less capacity, and they're focusing on Oakland, thinking that they're going to win Oakland. And Bobby Seale does pretty well. I mean, he gets a significant portion of the vote, but he doesn't win. Uh, and so this is uh, this is one of the pitfalls of this new program: is it's really pushed into this kind of NGO service style plus electoral politics. <coughs> so even if you pay some sort of lip service at all to guerrilla struggle, it's not there in reality, right? Also, the the, the images change. You don't get the pigs and the guns and all this stuff in the Panther Party newspaper as much anymore. After 1971, 1972, this stuff goes away, right? Even em Emory Douglas, who was drawing all that stuff earlier, he, his, his artistic style begins to change, right? It's a, it's a new kind of imagery, right? Uh, it's, it's very powerful imagery of, of black men and black women uh, engaged in, in, in all kinds of things, feeding children, doing all kinds of very beautiful activities, but it's no longer, uh, you know, stick them up, uh, gun to the pig, you know what I mean? It's no longer that kind of image. So, yeah, I think I think even if there's any kind of lip service paid to it, it, it wasn't it wasn't meant to be anything immediate, and it wasn't meant to be anything serious. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Well, uh, and you guys can respond to each other too. I mean, I'm not an expert. I, I'm just a guy. You know what I mean? So you guys just talk to each other as well. Yeah. So just a little bit louder. So the question, the ways you responded to each question has tied up a link to each one of them. Along the line, I just had just one question. Okay. Or is, I, is there any investigation or maybe any research that shows the influence of neoliberalism in views um, narrative? And it's important because um, I don't see the, intercom the intercommunal idea as a problem in of itself. Mm -hmm. If there was an aspect of optimism, mm -hmm. because clearly we see the benefits of it today of being raped in the communities. And this is the clearly. You see the benefits of it where? Of, of, in terms of the programs given to kids. Right. And stuff like that, because clearly when people talk about black fantasy, they, yeah. they, 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 they reference to that. But I mean, unfortunately, as you mentioned, the NG, it came with an NGO model, and basically we see it repeat everywhere in the world. And it seems to be that it was influenced by that. So do you think there was some kind of an op that was pushing out some kind of narratives into it that were just buying it up as it was regressed? I mean, the, the, the regression seems to be very steady, unlike that of Cleveland. So is there maybe any? Um, research or report or maybe conspiracy theory that's something like that. <laughs> yeah, actually, I think that's a really brilliant link. Um, I, I don't, so it's difficult because Newton's never coming out and saying, you know, I'm, I'm engaged in neoliberal economics. Mean, of course, you know what I mean? But, but do I think that, that at the time, this kind of thinking is, is, is beginning to take hold and take root in community and, and, and consciously, or at least consciously pushed by those in power? Absolutely. And it doesn't have an influence. Yeah, I think it has an influence on the left today. I think it has an influence on how we understand struggles and how we understand a variety of it. The, the reason that we say uh, everything we do is hyper-individualized today. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm an ally of this particular struggle. Or I'm, uh, I, I, no longer do we talk about alliance. We don't talk about alliances. You don't have a strategic alliance with blocks, right? You don't have two communities who are engaged in an alliance. You have an individual who stands as an ally of something else, right? That's a very different conception of revolutionary struggle than existed with Cleaver, right? Who's talking about alliances with actual power blocks, right? With communities and states and revolutionary organizations, right? That are bigger than just individuals standing as an ally of this movement and are ally of this, this particular thing, right? And so I think, I think the left, Newton beginning, beginning in, in some ways with Newton, has internalized the logic of neoliberalism. I think that partially this is the, you operate on a micro level, it's only the community, it's these individual small interactions, you know, and, and this, this leads to all kinds of this. There's a very brilliant educational piece 
where, where Fred Hampton, if you guys know Fred Hampton, type in Fred Hampton Educational Program, he's sitting, and these two guys are up to him and say, hey, we want to start a community bank. And he says, what do you mean about a community bank? You know, you need a political program. You need to talk about, uh, you know, revolution in, in Vietnam, right? They're talking about forming a communist state in Vietnam. And you're talking to me about a community bank. You want to give out loans for a, for a couch, all right? And Fred Hampton is, like, incredulous at this. Now, not to say that loans for the couch aren't important, right? People need the couches to sit on. But, but... We, we also want to create a state where you provide everyone with a couch, yeah. and a nice couch, right? And a nice home, and health care, and education. And you don't do that through microloans or through these small little community banks. So I think, I think you're absolutely on to something. I think it's, a, it's, it's something that deserves a lot of serious, serious historical study. Hopefully, my dissertation will be part of that. So let's, we'll definitely continue this conversation as well. I think it's a very important one. Uh, just to get, if, is there anyone else who hasn't spoken yet? And then we'll, we'll end, maybe end on this one? OK, yeah, oh, thanks. Man. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Please. Is there someone else over here? Okay. No? Okay. So I got my drink. But, okay, so um, <laughs> just playing around with this, what, what is the space for electoral politics? Oh, man. I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, like, for real, I'm thinking about it every day. I mean, and, <laughs> like, is there a space? I don't I can't even, like, put it. Is there really a space for folks uh, within? Like, is there any space for like folks within um, communities um, that have historically been oppressed or are facing a sort of like liberation movement to kind of throw folks in, um, but also to kind of destroy the system within? This is a, this is like I'm just playing with it, right? right. Uh, do you have any kind of like insight on this? Because you've been doing, you've been waiting on this for so. Long. And my my hunt my so my initial hunch is to say. I, look, I don't. I, I, let me preface this by saying I don't have an answer. Gotcha, gotcha. If I had an answer, we would we have a revolution by now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what I will say is that is there a space for electoral politics, abstractly, theoretically? I'd say yeah, of course. You can engage in some, perhaps. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's all kind. You can use them as a litmus test for ideas. You can use them as uh, attempting to uh, sort of destabilize current existing electoral blocks. You can do it. There's all. I mean, you know, there's all kinds of ways that you perhaps electoral politics can be useful. Do I think in this particular historic context at this moment, where there was, I mean, if 1968 was truly the, the year of the heroic guerrilla. Uh, where then you're saying, no, 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 in 1971, let's back off and do electoral politics, and let's do NGO programs. When Eldridge Cleaver is pr providing a very different alternative model that's saying, no, we need to have a revolution, right? And, and not only that, but we have a lot of people who are armed with guns. And, and we have a lot of people who are, we have guys like Geronimo Pratt, Pratt who are trying to actually uh, set up the, the, the basic clandestine apparatus for some kind of revolution. Do I think that at that particular juncture, you say, no, let's let's go to Oakland and do electoral politics in Oakland. I think probably it was a mistake. I mean, but 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 I, but I also understand it. I also understand it because the Panthers have been hit very very hard. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And in, in, in a very destructive capacity by J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI and Cointel Bro. So I understand it. I, I just don't know. I, I think it's a it's it's a theoretical question that I can't answer, and we can only answer it in very particular historical moments. And I think here it was it was probably the wrong approach, personally. Uh, well, one more question I'd probably be making over. Well, no, um, yeah, then we got a quick uh, ask about If I uh, can be so bold, you did say that we could respond to each other as uh, well. Please, yes, and you may fine. feel that you don't have an answer, but I feel that I do. Perfect. Please um, take I the do, answer. I, um, I feel that there isn't like a space for electoral politics because like, let's bring this back to black liberation. Let's bring this back to Palestine, right? Let's bring, that, bring this to the here and now in Texas. Beto and uh, Cruz are both Zionists, right? That it's like, sure. there are no pro-Palestinians in any position in the United States anywhere, right? That it's like, there's no space for, for the, these people in electoral politics. How can there be a space for black people in electoral politics in a country built by slaves? For a group of people who didn't get their voting rights until the 60s, you know? So it's like, you know, we want, to have, we want to be engaged immediately, and that's good, and we should hold on to that, right? But but we don't want, we want to learn from the Panthers' mistakes. The mistake that they made was like, well, we have to do something immediately, and 
you know, they capitulated. They lost like the revolutionary struggle. One of their biggest strengths was their internationalism and they capitulated to national chauvinism. And they um, said, well, we have to do something immediately. Let's, you know, let's do charity programs and let's run electoral politics. And that took building for revolution off the table. So we shouldn't lose our hunger and we should learn from this lesson and if we want to, you know, it take electoral politics takes a lot of energy. It's not like it's easier than doing militant grassroots community organizing, and it's a lot less rewarding. I think that we should try to build for revolution in everything that we do. I think. But well, I, 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 okay, really quickly, yeah, we have our response. Go ahead. I definitely want to make sure that we are well aware that the FBI and the government was after the Black Panthers, so we can't sure. compete. For sure, and say that like if they would have continued in their like in the model, that they wouldn't have. Like, not hey, I'm not for it, but I'm just playing with you. Oh, absolutely. Right? I mean, these are these are this is this is spaces where these ideas should be played with. Yeah, I, I just think that if void of the amount of um, you know finkles of like nonsense from the from the FBI, it's possible that things would have gone different if we went in this way. I'm not saying before, but just looking at it. Oh, not, not designing a spark, right, but right. just the idea yeah. of, <laughs> just the idea of making sure that the here and now in the own community is just like, I'm just like right. really interested in seeing what would have happened if the government didn't throw their hands in there as much as, as, much as they did. So. Yeah, I mean, I think that's always, it's always the question, right? Is it, I mean, it's, it is very easy for us. Well, first of all, none of us are engaged in armed struggle right now, you know what I mean? And so it's very easy for us to say, even you know, for me as a historian, to say, well, this, is, this would have been a better path in terms of revolution, right? But it's, we're also not, you know, I mean, it means, it means you're gonna have your offices attacked and you're gonna be assassinated in your home at four in the morning by the Chicago Police Department. And it means that there's a lot of things that that means, you know what I mean, a lot of things that entail. Now that's not to say that you don't take that path, right? It's not to say that you don't, it just means that you, there's a lot that goes into deciding to take that path. So I think we have to be fair, at least fair to understanding the different, the different trajectories. I, I side with Cleaver, you know? I mean, I'm, I'll be totally honest, I, I, my sympathies are with Cleaver in this historic moment. Cleaver as an individual, he does all kinds of crazy things later. But, but here, I'm, I'm with Cleaver, I think he was right. Uh, but I, I don't know. Um, yeah, I think it's a very, a very important discussion. But I know Dina's been looking at me like, hey, no, keep going. Talk. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> um, but no, but, I, but thank you guys very, very much. Honestly, it's a discussion that has to continue for for a long time. And uh, just you know, also hopefully I'll write something worthwhile eventually, and you guys can critique it and yell at me and do all kinds of things. It'd be very good. So thank you guys very much.